chapter 29 is the last chapter in the book. That's pretty exciting, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, communication and spatial cognitions. I'm probably going to divide it up into two sections. Um, we briefly started talking in the cerebral cortex chapter about um, aphasia, Broca's aphasia, and some other areas, and we're going to talk more about it um, in this chapter. So for the learning objectives, I want you to be able to describe the locations and functions of Wernicke's area and Broca's area. And um, then into part two, describe Wernicke's and Broca's aphasia and what's the difference between the two and um, how, how they affect people. I want you to compare and contrast dysarthria, which we talked about in the cerebral chapter, Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, conductive aphasia, and global aphasia. So these are all speech-related disorders. Um, I want you to be able to define and describe the clinical implications of unilateral neglect and um, agno and agnosia. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it and I'll learn how to pronounce it. So um, the, the temporal parietal association area, which is kind of like the junction between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe, is specialized for understanding communication, directing attention, and comprehending space. In approximately 95% of adults, cortical areas responsible for understanding language and producing speech are found in the left hemisphere. And the comprehending space part is found in the right hemisphere. The distinction between language and speech is clinically important. So we're going to talk about it. So the left hemisphere typically specializes in understanding and producing language, including speech and writing. Um, the right hemisphere specializes in understanding space, organizing movements relative to spatial orientation, navigating and understanding and producing nonverbal communication. So a big part of our communication is nonverbal. And a lot of times you don't notice it unless somebody doesn't have that, and it's very noticeable, very noticeable. So if you work with people who have had strokes, you will often pe um, work with people who have deficits in these areas. It's very interesting. So language um, includes spoken, written, and signed language, so like um, American Sign Language, ASL. So language comprehension comprehension occurs in Wernicke's area. So symbols are, are words or signs that represent an object or concept. Um, so you can think of Wernicke's area as sort of like being the association area for um, language. So that's where comprehension occurs. So you have the language, um, and that's where you figure out what it really means. Broca's area is like the premotor area for language output. It provides instructions for language output. But beyond just the motor part of it, it also provides um, the grammatical relationship between words when writing. And Wernicke's area provides formulation of language, like putting the language together. Um, the interesting thing, when you learn a new language, so like say I speak English and I'm learning Japanese, theoretically, <laughs> you actually develop new, um, new brain cells, new neurons in Wernicke's area to represent each language that you know. Isn't that cool? I just love that idea. So I'm really trying, I'm trying to build up my um, Japanese Wernicke's area. <laughs> so here's the, here's the path for language, which I think is super interesting. So the primary auditory, so a lot of our um, sensory cortexes um, and motor cortexes are involved in this too. So um, the primary auditory cortex is auditory discrimination. It says, oh, I hear a sound. Oh, there it is. I hear a sound. 
it gives it to the sensor, uh, secondary auditory cortex. And the sen secondary auditory cortex classifies it. It says, oh, it's music, it's language, it's whatever. It goes, oh, language, send it to Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area will process that. So if the secondary auditory cortex um, classifies a sound as language versus other sounds, it goes to Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area is vocabulary, um, auditory comprehension. Um, there are subcortical connections that link Wernicke's and Broca's area, and that's represented by that little dotted line in this diagram. Um, Broca's area gives the instructions for language output, so that's our premotor speech area. And then um, oral and throat region of the sensory motor cortex gives you the cortical output to the speech muscles. So very similar to um, our other processing where it comes in the primary sensory cortex, then to the secondary sensory cortex, the association cortices, which Wernicke's is sort of the association cortex for speech, and then you go to the, pr the premotor area, and then the motor cortex gives the output to the muscles. So very similar, but this is specific for language. Pretty cool, right? So these are three language disorders that we're going to talk about. Um, aphasia is a language disorder that affects spoken language. So um, we're going to talk about several different types of aphasia, including Wernicke's, Broca's, conduction, and global. Um, alexia is a language disorder affecting the comprehension of written language. So lexia is writing, and alexia means you can't do it, or you can't read it. Agraphia is a language disorder affecting the ability to write. So all of these different things. So you could have aphasia and still be able to read and write. Um, you could have um, aphasia that also has alexia or agraphia, so you can't read and write. All of those are language disorders. So in Wernicke's aphasia, language comprehension is impaired. So remember, it's the association area. So you can hear it, and you have the output, but you don't have the association to make sense of it. So people with Wernicke's aphasia easily produce spoken sounds, but the output is meaningless because they lack the ability to assign meaning, to associate the words with meaning. Um, people with Wernicke's aphasia have alexia as well, ability, inability to write meaningful words, um, and paraphasia, which is the use of unintended words or phrases. Um, the inability to produce and understand language may be analogous to when a person with intact native language encounters an unknown foreign language. So like I go to Japan and I look at the signs and I have alexia <laughs> because I can't read them. I know it's language, but I can't read the sign. And I can't understand what people are saying. People with Wernicke's aphasia often appear to be unaware of the disorder. So there's some really good videos um, that are linked in the module. There's one with a person with Wernicke's aphasia being interviewed by a therapist, and one with a person with Broca's aphasia, and you can see the difference between the two. So an, a synonym for Wernicke's aphasia is fluent aphasia, because people can easily produce spoken sounds. Their language sounds fluent, but the output is meaningless or disorganized. So Broca's aphasia is difficulty expressing oneself using language. People with Broca's aphasia may not produce any language output, or they may be able to generate small or habitual phrases. Um, people with Broca's aphasia, like people with Wernicke's aphasia, are often unaware of their language difficulties, but people with Broca's aphasia are usually aware of their difficulties and are frustrated by it. Like they can't get the words out, they can't find the right word. Um, it's also call, called motor aphasia because Broca's is the premotor area for speech, expressive aphasia, and non-fluent aphasia. So that's all syn uh, synonymous with Broca's. Wernicke's is often caused uh, called fluent um, aphasia and, um, and receptive aphasia sometimes, and Broca's is motor, expressive, or non-fluent. 
So conduction aphasia results from damage to the neurons that connect Wernicke's and Broca's areas. Remember on that chart a few slides back, it's that dotted uh, line on four. So those are the subcortical connections that link Wernicke's and Broca's. Um, so in most severe for, uh, form of conduction aphasia, speech and writing of people um, with conduction aphasia are meaningless because they can't connect the meaning with the output. So we've got a connection problem. Global aphasia is the most severe form of aphasia, and it's the inability to use language in any form. People with global aphasia cannot produce understandable speech. They cannot comprehend spoken language. They cannot speak fluently. They cannot read, and they cannot write. Um, it's usually secondary to a large lesion damaging most of the lateral left cerebrum. So that's the most um, severe form of aphasia. So with nonverbal communication, it includes gestures, facial expressions, tone of voice, and posture. Um, they convey meanings in addition to a verbal message. The right hemisphere um, inferior frontal gyrus provides instruction for producing nonverbal communication, including emotional gestures and intonation of speech. So um, we'll talk about spatial perception in the next section, but people with um, lesions in the right temporal parietal junction, which is the same area as Wernicke's and Broca's in the um, left side, they uh, might speak in a monotone. They're unable to effectively communicate um, non-verbally. They have difficulty understanding non-verbal communication. And they lack emotional um, facial expressions and gestures, so they have a very flat affect.